So we have gotten to our last week of working through Ephesians, and we've talked kind of every week about how this book is split into two parts, right? There is the first part of the book that grounds us and roots us in the gospel, And then there's the second part of the book that talks about how we can respond to that gospel, how we as Christians are supposed to act. And this passage that we're going to read today is the pivot point between the two. This last thing that roots us and grounds us in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus Christ, so that we can know what we can do from it. And this passage, in the way that it moves from that, it kind of wrestles with this balance of what we do and what God does that yes, there is good work for you to do. That yes, there are things that you, ways that you should follow God. There are things that are set aside for you to do in your life. But God does not leave you alone in that. And so as we finish our, our first half of Ephesians, we're going to return to Ephesians again in the new year, but we're in Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21, where it gives us this last little bit to root us in the good news of Christ. And here's what it says. It says, starting in verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray, sorry, that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that in Christ you may, oh, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's, all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of Christ is, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. I know that I uh, fumbled through that passage a little bit uh, as I read it, but have you ever found that when you read scripture, it's a little bit aggravating, especially with Paul, that you're like, Paul, can you just speak plain? Like, can you just, like, tell me the thing that I actually—I don't know if you fall into this trap sometimes, but there there are times when I read scripture, sometimes especially when I read Paul, and I I have, like, pronounced all of the words correctly, and I have made it through all of the sentences, and I get to the end, and I'm like, what did I just read? Has anyone been there before? Was anyone there this morning as I just read a passage for you? Sometimes it's actually even harder when someone else is reading it for you because they're going to read at a different pace or like I did this morning, they're going to trip over a couple of words and you've completely lost the meaning of the passage. Anybody there? Completely lost the meaning of the passage? Great. We are in it together this morning. Um, it, it's why I spend some time studying during the week uh, to be able to explain some of these things. But, but this is one of those passages that can be so aggravating because it's not really clear. Essentially what Paul is talking about is he's praying for the work of God in our lives that at the end he says that Ephesians, uh, with the end goal that they may be filled with the fullness of God. Right? That's where he ends. I pray that you would be filled with the fullness of God. Good? You get it now? We set? No! That's an unclear statement too, isn't it? Like that's a hard thing. What does it mean to be filled with the fullness of God? And and there's a lot happening here. There's a lot going on. But essentially what it means is that you're going to be filled with the defining characteristic of God. The defining characteristic that Paul keeps returning to in this passage, that God, that you are going to be filled with love. We can sum this whole passage up with just a statement that says, I pray that God would help you become the love of God. That's what Paul is is praying for these uh, Ephesian Christians, and you've got to love the Trinitarian structure that's happening here. Did anyone pick up on that? It talks about the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that it's the Father who sets the way and sends the Spirit that it's the Spirit who strengthens your inner being, that it's the person of Christ who who dwells in your heart to make you new. Like, you get the image of that that all of God, all that God is, is is worked up in this work of making you new. Like, this isn't God's side hustle. Like, this is his main job. He is working to transform you into who you are meant to be. The the living love of God. And, And again, there's this weird tension that we have as Christians between what you do and what God does for you, right? Have you ever felt this before as a Christian? This, like, tension of, like, uh, like I know I'm doing something good, but God is also doing and, and maybe you've had this happen where you've seen another Christian do something good and you've complimented them. You've been like, hey, it was really awesome to see you, uh, like, love someone well or care for someone well. And they were like, it wasn't me, it was God. Has, it, has anyone gotten this response? And on some level, yes, that's true. It wasn't you, it was God. But, but on some level, aren't you like, wait, but you remember doing it, though, right? 
Like, you remember the feeling of sacrifice. Like, it's not like you were possessed and God controlled you. Like, you still remember doing it, right? Like, you remember how hard it was to let go of that bad habit? You, you rem- there is this weird tension now that we live in as Christians that, that God is working in you to make you the new you. That God is working in you to make you the one who is not overcome by evil, but overcomes evil with good. That as a Christian, good actions are as natural as, like, fruit coming from a fruit tree. It, like, there is this tension that we know that Christ, that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. But we still do it. Like, we still have to do those things. There's still work involved. And, and, and it's like, there is now this partnership that's happening. That between you and God, you do these things together. The, the life that you lead, the life that you lead, where you are becoming more and more like love, that you do this thing together. And Paul says that he prays that God would send the Spirit to strengthen your inner being. And Paul uses this term inner being two other times. The first time he's just talking about like your thought process. The second time he's talking about the, the difference between your inside and your outside. Really simply put, when he says the Spirit is sent to, to strengthen your inner being, he just means that he prays that God would send the Spirit to strengthen you. The you that you are, not the you that you show people. And, and this phrase inner being, right, it, it, it raises kind of that little question of... Uh, we are really practiced at putting on masks, aren't we? Sometimes it's really hard to sort out, like, who's the real me? Has anyone ever wondered that? Like, you're with one group of people and you act one way, and you're with another group of people and you act a different way, and you're like, oh, which one's me? Which one's the real me? And sometimes I feel like this happens, especially at church, doesn't it? Where somewhere along the way it felt like putting on our Sunday best also meant acting our Sunday best, and we put on our Sunday best mask, where even if something is going on that's hard in our life, we smile more where we use our big and holy words so people think that we're big and holy? Have you, have you done this? Especially if you're called up front to pray, have you, like, thesaurus some big words? Like, we do this. We pretend that we're bigger and holier, especially when we're in church, and we become practiced at putting on this mask, and God is not fooled by your mask. Like, God is not here to strengthen the you that you are at church or the you that you are at school, or the you that you are when your grandma is watching, or the you that you are when you're watching like the Georgia Bulldogs and they're losing and no one else is around and your filter is off. Like, God is not here to strengthen all of the different masks that you put on. The Spirit is sent to you to strengthen the you that you are. That like center inner part of yourself. God sees that part. Even if you are able to fool everybody else, God sees that part. He knows you and he sees you in your inmost being. And the Spirit is there not to help you make a a more convincing mask that people might think that you are loving. But the Spirit is there to actually help you be more loving. We can get into these habits where we are kind to people's faces and bitter in our hearts. Where we are welcoming to people but judgmental in our side little circles. God does not play that game. That dividing ourselves up game into different parts No, God comes to strengthen the you that you are. And and the Spirit is sent to to strengthen you, and then it says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I'm not going to lie, this is like a difficult phrase for me. Because as much as I'm the person that wants to throw open the, the doors of the church and say all are welcome, and we need to be people who are grounded in what holds us together in Christ and not our differences of interpretation, Like, we need people who realize that we as Christians are on the same team and we need to work together even when we disagree. Like, theology still matters, doesn't it? Like, having good answers still matters. And and I look at this phrase of of Christ living in our hearts, and we use this a lot, right? Of inviting Jesus to live in your heart. And sometimes I think that phrase can get in the way of the historical thing that Jesus actually did. And, like, the actual hope that we have in Jesus. And when I look at the story of Scripture, I see that Jesus became a human. And he was born as a human, and he lived as a human, and he did things as a human, and he died as a human, and then he was raised again as a human in a new and resurrected body, and then he ascended into heaven as the new human to remind us of what we can get someday, and there he sits on the right hand of God the Father, ruling and reigning. As I look at the historical story of what Jesus does, like, he doesn't stop being a human in a body. Jesus is raised again as a human in a body, and I think, you know, like, I don't know if there's space for another body in my body. Like, I, I've been to health class. I know my, like, atriums or ventricles are big or something, but I don't feel like I can fit a Christ in there. So someone who maybe knows more about science and has been to nursing school just uh, assumes that I got everything wrong. But, like, like, if Jesus lives in a body, 
he can't fit in my body anymore. Because he is still human, intercessing for us with God. He is the one who understands you most. And having these right answers, this right theology matters. Because Jesus isn't the one who can live in our bodies. Because he already has his own. The, the person of God who lives in you, who empowers you, who dwells in you, that's the Spirit. Because the Spirit is a Spirit. And the Spirit can dwell in your body because the Spirit doesn't have a body of its own. And the Spirit can join you and empower you in everything that you do. And then I'm left with like, well then, how do I interpret this passage that says that Paul is asking that Christ dwell in your hearts? And if that can't mean that his body dwells in my body like he fits inside here sometime, it has to mean something else. And, and notice he doesn't say that Jesus would dwell in your hearts. He says Christ. And, and Christ is not Jesus' last name, and his middle name is an H. Like, Christ, Christ is not just another word that we use as a stand-in for Jesus. Christ is his title. Christ just means the anointed one. It's a thing that they used to do to, like, anoint kings or anoint priests, and it turns out that our Christ, Jesus Christ, is both. And he is the anointed one, the king, who has come to set everything right. That we call Jesus, when we call Jesus Christ, we are calling him the Christ. That he is the one that fills this role to reverse the patterns of sin and death and to make things right again. This is his role and not necessarily his name. And so when I read this idea that Christ can can dwell in our hearts. It, it's the same for me as that he sits on the right hand of God the Father, that he reigns and he rules. That when I make the statement that Jesus dwells in my heart, it's not that his body is in my body. It is that my heart is a part of his kingdom. That thing that I am, everything that I am, my inner being, myself, my heart, my mind, God doesn't play the break yourself up into parts game. He sees you, the whole you. That inner being is a part of Christ's kingdom too. And with all that I am and all that I do, I seek to follow him. Christ reigns in me. The Spirit empowers me. And Christ reigns over me that I may become more like him. But we've still dwelt in this, like, personal zone, haven't we? Of, like, Jesus, the, the Spirit lives in you. Jesus will make you more like him. But the wonderful thing about Christianity is it's not, that all, it's not all about you, right? We gather together with each other. And Paul works this in to the phrase, he says that you, together with all the Lord's people, may grasp how wide and deep and high and long the love of Christ is. And last week we touched on this a little bit. That, that when, when Paul is talking about God gathering together Jews and Gentiles, what God is doing is he's gathering together diverse peoples to be able to worship God together, that they might know God through each other's eyes. And you get this wonderful multifaceted and multilayered gift of perspective, right? We, we talked about that a little bit last week, that on your own, you cannot grasp how big God's love is because your life is too small for that. And, and, and on their own, the Jews could not grasp how big the love of God is because their shared experiences are too small for that. Like, no, no one person or one people group can contain the true immensity of an infinitely loving God. And, and I know that really well from my experience of, like, I, I used to be at a church that was a mostly wealthy, mostly white church. And I came to Redeemer, and it is a different church. It is a church of different people. And I'm telling you right now, when I came here, it was a learning curve. Did anyone else feel the Redeemer learning curve? Of you came here, and you worship with people who weren't like you, and you realized that God was bigger than you thought he was. Like, I came here, and I had a degree in theology— but when I gathered together and worshiped together with people who were different, I realized that God's, God and God's love was bigger than I thought he was. That we can only grasp the true immensity of God's love when we grasp it together. For them, it was Jews and Gentiles. For us and my people who vote differently, who are different ages than you are, who see the world differently, who root for different teams, who are different genders, who uh, have different socioeconomic levels, like whatever some of those divisions are that we have between people, when we gather and worship together, we get to see God through other people's eyes and we get to come together and realize, oh, God was bigger than I had originally thought he was. God has lived in your life in a way that he hasn't lived in my life, and I'm so glad I got to see him through your eyes because now I know his love to be deeper than I thought it was before. And there is this wonderful Christian tradition of pilgrimages. 
Has anyone heard of these before? And we don't normally do those anymore. Normally it's like a Middle Ages thing where people would go to like a holy church or a holy grave site where there were like the bones of a saint. And it's probably a good thing that we don't do that anymore because saints' bones are the same as our bones. They're just bones. Like there's no special power there. Like we don't really do that. But there is this wonderful tradition of pilgrimage where you go somewhere where God is and you find that he is there differently than you knew and you find that he is bigger than you thought he was. And the beautiful gift of the church is that pilgrimage doesn't mean that I need to go to some church to see the bones of St. Thomas and pay a fee to be able to see them. The beauty of the church is that pilgrimage happens here. Pilgrimage happens anytime we gather together with a small group or with a Sunday school class and we see God through someone else's eyes and we think, ah, God is bigger than I thought it was. His love is deeper and higher and wider than I thought it was. For real, take a minute and look around the room for a second. I know that's like an uncomfortable thing that I said, but like I, I notice a lot of you still looking at me. If you're at home, you can just stare lovingly into your wife's eyes, like whatever you have to do, but look around the room for a second. There are pilgrimages to be had here. There are people in this room who have known God differently than you have known God. And when you experience God through their eyes, he will be bigger and greater than you had ever thought or imagined. Like, I know God through my life as like a 30-something-year-old white guy from New England. But in the gift of the church, in this gift of pilgrimage that we get together, I get to know how God's love has been present in a single mom. Or how God's love has been present in like a student going to school in 2022. I get to know how God's love is present from charis people who grew up in charismatic backgrounds or Catholic backgrounds. Like when we gather together like this, we get this beautiful gift of seeing God through other people's eyes. And it is together, not alone, that we more fully grasp this unknowable, too grand love of God. That, that's a love so big that if all the books on earth were written about it, it would still be too big for those books to contain it. But that's part of the gift of the church is that we get to know the lived experience of other Christians and see that God is bigger. And we do that so that we might be filled to the full measure of all of the fullness of God. And you're like, Paul, what the what are you talking about? Those words don't mean anything. Like, am I going to become a genie like Jafar became a genie? Like, am I going to be filled with phenomenal powers of God? Like, am I going to become God? Like, what's happening here? No, it, it just means that the defining characteristic of God, his love, will become your defining characteristic as well. That, that his love is at work within you and within your community so that you can know what his love is like. And when you know the depth and the breadth and the height and the width of God's love, when you experience that together as Christians who are different and have seen God show up differently, when you know that no matter what you do or how far you run, his love will not abandon you. Because you've heard that over and over again through the stories of people who are not you you will know that you are well and truly loved. And loved people love people. I'm going to say that again. Loved people love people. Haven't you seen this to be true? When you're in a place where you feel unloved, aren't you more likely to think of yourself as unworthy? Aren't you more likely to take slight at an innocuous comment? When you feel unloved, aren't you more likely to feel bitter when someone does something? that you feel like they did it to you and they didn't do it to you. They just did something and it affected you. And there was no reason for you to be angry. But when you feel unloved, you don't love people well. Has anyone found this to be true in their lives? Has anyone ever found this to be true in their relationships, in, in your friendships or, or, or your, especially your marital relationships? When your spouse feels unloved, isn't it harder for them to love you? When you feel poorly loved, don't you love poorly? This is like a, a natural reaction that happens in us. But when you grow a deeper recognition of Christ's love for you, when you begin to grasp together how big God's love is for you, then you start to know that you are well and truly loved. And loved people love people. Over time, the fullness of God's love dwells within you that you become his living love on this earth. The defining characteristic of God, his love, becomes your defining characteristic as well. The people can be like, oh, you know Bobby? He's like love. Like, oh, you know Peter? He's like love. Because the defining characteristic of God becomes your defining characteristic together. And it's why we come back here every week. 
It's why Christians talk about love so often. It's why I said love like 67 times so far today. It's because this thing, it's not like we, we forget about love. It's not like this is the first time and you're shocked to hear that God loves you. Like, I have not shared anything new today. I have not been like, God loves you, and you're like, oh, dang. That puts everything together. I never knew this before. No, we come together. It's not because we forget or we haven't assented and agreed that God loves us. It's because we, we lose track of the depth of his love, don't we? The, the reason why we worship and call out these words of like, you're never going to let me down. We may know that, but we lose track of the depth of it, don't we? It's why Christians gather together in small groups, not because necessarily that someone's going to share something that we've never heard before, but when we see it through their eyes, we remember the depth of God's love for us. We don't need to be reminded that he loves us. We need to be reminded how well he loves us. Because when you feel that way, when you are filled with the fullness of God's love, you will love people well. Loved people love people. And yes, God is doing something in you. Yes, God, it, God is making things happen in you. Yes, the Spirit is empowering you, and, and Christ is dwelling in your heart, and God is setting out plans for you, and, and you still got to do something, right? Like, you're still going to have to do something. And, and Paul saves the whole second and half of the letter to talk about ways that we can love people and love God well. And, and if you're setting out to try and do that, you're going to have to, like, fail and try again. You're going to have to work on a lot of humility to work out how to love people well. Like, you're going to have to learn what love is like. But Paul wants to make one thing clear before we move on to what you should do, that God does not leave you alone in this. That as you look to love people well, that is empowered by God. That that is designed by the Father. That that is guided by the Spirit. That in Christ that is enabled and made real in your life. And if you notice this passage, this whole passage is actually not something that's meant to teach us. Paul says, I pray a bunch of times. He's just reminding them of a prayer that he prays for these Ephesian Christians. Because to be fully filled with God's love is not something you can do on your own. It's not something that Paul can do for the Ephesians. It's not something the Ephesians can do for themselves. It is something that God needs to do for them. And so we're just going to take a minute today and pray together. And if you're feeling like you're in a place where you feel distant from God, if you're feeling like you're in a place where, where you don't feel loved by God, where you may have like assented to that and you agree that that's a thing, but you need to be reminded of how deep that love is for you, then I, I would urge you to pick up some wonderful Christian practices like getting in a small group where you can hear of God through someone else's eyes. Like spending some time in scripture or prayer or meditation that you can devote yourself personally to him. But all of those practices will, will fall flat if God doesn't show up. You can do all the right things, but if God doesn't show up, it's not going to matter. So I would love, if you're willing, just to spend a moment in prayer today to ask God to do these things in our life so that we can be people who are so filled with his love that it overflows around us. And we're going to put some words on the screen that's going to reflect the passage that we just read. And if this is your prayer today, you can feel free to pray that out loud if you want. You can feel free to pray that in your head if you want. You can feel free to just think those words. Whatever it looks like, God will hear it. Because when we invite God to actually strengthen us, when we invite Christ to actually dwell in our hearts, when we invite the Lord to actually make us more like love, God shows up. So let's pray together. God, strengthen us by your Spirit so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Root and establish us in love that we may know and be filled with your love. And help us to live out your love in everything we do. Amen.